President-elect Trump's team seems to be moving quickly. A chief of staff has already been named. There are several ideas who might be tabbed to be USDA secretary and U.S. trade rep. And with the dust beginning to settle, where does that leave biofuels, the Farm Act, the Farm Bill, and other key ag initiatives? Live, taking the initiative via Farm Journal broadcast, this is Agritalk. This morning, it's our Friday free for all with panelists Jim Wiesmeyer and from Real yes. Ag Radio, the Alberta Breeze, Sean Haney. Directly following the news, Jennifer Scheich from Farm Journal's Pork. I'm handsome newsman Davis Michelson, now the host of Agritalk, Chap Laurie. All right, Davis. Yeah, man, and it, yeah, we're going to try to get Brian Grady in here, too, the editor at Pro Farmer. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Very good. So Very for good. a couple of reasons, for a couple of reasons, we need his input on what is going on and where these other ag initiatives might be going and, and what farmers are talking about it in, in the days following the election. But we've also got that report coming up uh, at 11 o'clock central time this morning, less than an hour mm-hmm. away. We get an update on the crop production. We get an update on supply and demand estimates from USDA. So getting Brian in here, I think, uh, uh, would do us all some good. How you doing, man? Everything okay? Really good. Your initiative is is impressive this morning. You took the initiative to reach out to Grady to discuss yeah. the initiatives. Right. Wow. That, right. Like somewhere my guidance counselor is like, see, this is what I've been telling you about. <laughs> this is an object lesson for all of us. It's the initiative. <laughs> It, that's how you pull ahead <laughs> i, I see do. i hear you mm-hmm. i hear you mm-hmm. man yeah. we have got a beautiful morning up here in northeast iowa a oh, beautiful morning the sun is shining mm-hmm. um we have got a solid 48 degrees and i'm doing that all so that i can do a shout out to the denver cyclones your Whee! class 2a girls volleyball state champions Mm-hmm. Way to go, Cyclones! And they had to they, squeeze to by that. my alma mater to get their frequent champions from DNH. Not ah, just Titans, frequent. Titans went down to the Cyclones this year. Congratulations to y'all. Yep, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, D, the rivalry between Denver and DNH. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in girls volleyball and well, in girls soccer and boys basketball and oh, yeah. football sports, and everything everything yeah yes all sports it, it's been uh pretty it, that has been a fun rivalry over the years no doubt okay man let's get started with the news what do you got yeah man the national weather service is calling for winter storms to bring significant heavy snowfall and blizzard conditions to portions of colorado and new mexico on friday Showers and thunderstorms to bring the threat of flash flooding to the central and southern plains Friday and to the lower Mississippi Valley on Saturday. Above average temperatures continue for much of the country heading into the weekend. Chip, I was taping an episode of Grow Getters yesterday at noon central time here with some good folks in Colorado up at 9,000 feet. There was a lovely snowfall going on as we talked there in Colorado. Well, I'll bet that lovely snowfall turned into about two foot. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. the, the way that it's been snowing out there in the, on the Eastern, uh, Eastern range. So, yep. wow, wow, wow. They're getting dumped on in the first one. Yep. Well, you mentioned those reports, USDA's corn and soybean crop estimates are not likely to change much in the crop production report no. at 11 AM. That's coming up in just less than an hour here. Yep. And Chip, Donald Trump reportedly has won Nevada and Arizona, according to decision desk HQ. Mr. Trump made Las Vegas a frequent stop on the campaign trail, reported, uh, repeatedly promoting his no tax on tips pledge in a state where a significant number of residents work for tipped wages. Yeah. OK, real quick. Decision Desk HQ has got the House standing at 216 GOP, 204 Democrats. The Senate is at 52 Republicans, 46 Democrats. Decision Desk HQ has not called Pennsylvania or Arizona. Uh, other news sources have called Pennsylvania for the Republican yeah. there and have it at 5346. And then, uh, yeah, 312. Uh, three, is, wow. it, is that right? 
312 electoral college votes for Trump, 226 for Harris. Wow. Well, President-elect Donald Trump has appointed senior campaign advisor Susie Wiles as White House chief of staff, marking the first woman to hold that position. Wiles, a veteran of Florida politics, will oversee White House operations and serve as a liaison with Congress and federal agencies. Trump praised Wiles for her strategic acumen and dedication. Yeah, we're going to learn more about uh, Susan and uh, uh, from Jim when he gets on here. I I just got to throw this out there. The yeah. daughter of Pat Summerall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotta love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the Federal Reserve yesterday implemented a widely anticipated 25 basis point rate cut, reducing the target range for the federal funds rate to 4.5% to 4.75%. Unanimous decision by the Federal Open Market Committee, Chip. Yeah. Uh, Global food. uh, Yeah, go on. uh, And the expectations are that there will be additional cuts, and Powell says he's not going anywhere. He's going to stay on on as as the chief. Well, the European Union and China say they have made some progress after a week of technical talks in Beijing aimed at scaling back or reversing European tariffs, the block applied to electric vehicles made in China. The EU's executive arm described the outcome of this week's negotiations as making, quote, technical progress, a stance echoed by China's Ministry of Commerce, Chip. All right. Thank you very much, Davis. Let's bring in Jennifer Scheich, editor at Farm Journal's Pork. Good morning, Jennifer. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good, good. Talk to me about the Ordinance 309 out in Colorado, uh, and specifically in Denver, right? Yes, it's an ordinance in Denver, and Denver voters had had a great opportunity this year to be able to to do the right thing, in my mind. And basically, <laughs> what they were trying to do was to um, take out this processing uh, plant that was in there. So it was basically called yeah. Prohibition of Slaughterhouses that just wanted to outlaw the construction, maintenance, or use of meat processing facilities in Denver starting January 1 of 2026. And that was voted down, um, which saved lots and lots of jobs from people in one of the poorest economic areas of the city that really need those jobs. And so it also affected beyond that, I think they said 2,700 ranchers, truckers, distributors, retailers, and so forth that um, contribute to that. And it's it's a hub for land processing. But basically why I'm so excited that it was voted down was it just would create another precedent to make it easier for animal activists to, to try to do this in other places. And so um, I think yeah. it's a, an awesome example of how industry came together. And so organizations came together, including the National Pork Producers Council, to put money into efforts to stop this. And that was called Stop the Ban, Protect Jobs. And shows the power of all of us working in agriculture to make sure that we protect our ability to make decisions and to be able to do what we do every day. So, yeah. Um, yeah. definite win. Yeah, definitely a win. And this was just an anti animal ag effort out there. It's not like some, you know, local coalition came up and said, we want to get rid of the slaughterhouse. This was a national effort. And uh, it was Mm -hmm. to get rid of animal agriculture. That was the goal there. Jennifer, good stuff. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. All right, get more on that at www.porkbusiness.com. Free for all, next. Perfect. AgriTalk is brought to you by USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Help keep African swine fever out of the U.S. by updating your biosecurity plan. Learn more at apis.usda.gov slash protect our pigs. This is just how I do this song now, Chip, by the way. Is it? Is yeah. it? I mean, yeah. AgriComputer could not have picked a better bump. No, it's perfect. Oh, jeez, yeah. that was perfect. Mm-hmm. That was unbelievable because we've got the free-for-all coming your way right now. Sean Haney, Real Agriculture, Real Ag Radio. How you doing, Sean? Chip, I am doing great. Fantastic. We've uh, had a busy news week. we got a great slate of college football this weekend. Yep. I'm, I'm ready to go. Yep, yep, yep. Hey, I don't know if you've 
realize this or it, this or not yet, but it's probably going to be a full four years of news items uh, that <laughs> that we're going to be able to talk about here on yeah, the free that, for all going forward. Y- y- you think? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're correct on that, my, my friend. I'm pretty sure you're correct. <laughs> yep, Brian Grady, Pro Farmer editor. Good morning, Brian. How you doing? Hey, Chip. I'm all right. Uh, Good. No, no complaints, I guess. Excellent. Excellent. Man, thank you so much for making time for us this morning. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Okay, Jim Wiesmeyer, Pro Farmer Policy Analyst. Good morning, Jim. Good morning from Tucson, Arizona, on my way back home to D.C., where the uh, Washington Commanders are 7-2. and two. <laughs> Washington. <laughs> that might be as surprising that might be as surprising as I want to get the numbers in front of me again here as 312 to 226 in the electoral college, Jim. I, so, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a landslide. It's just a shocking. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's at 312 yet, but he could be. Yeah, decision well, desk has put him there. Be, yeah. It's did they call Nevada? Yeah. Yep. Decision oh, desk Nevada. did. Okay. AP, AP oh, has wow. not. Okay. But decision desk did so. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. But the popular vote would even be well, that would be even more surprising than the three twelve on the electoral, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah, Five a little over million. four million. A little over four million. Four yeah. million gap. Yeah. It's it's uh, it it is pretty astonishing. So Jim, on Tuesday night, as it was becoming more and more clear that not only did uh, former president and now president-elect Trump, not only that he had a chance, but that it looked like he had a clear path. What was your thoughts? Uh, yeah, hold on just a sec. Yeah, Delta, and I'm on radio. I can't talk. Okay. All right. <laughs> him signing autographs. No, I'm okay. People are doing, se- people no, doing okay. selfies with him. It's, it's hard being Jim Wiesmeyer. It is. It is. <laughs> you Holy can... Chip, you could see it early in the counties in which Trump was consistently outperforming what he did before, and Kamala Harris was underperforming. Right. And so, and that's why this election was called far earlier than the experts said. Yeah, yeah. We had Frank Howie from North Carolina on the Farmer Forum on Wednesday, and I made the comment to him that, you know, North Carolina really gave us an indication early on in the night that that it was going to be a good night for Trump. And he says, ah, no, North Carolina was never in question uh, for Trump. And I said, yeah, but it was the margin in North Carolina that really told us a lot. or It, it, it got yeah. me leaning, that's for sure. Well, they the, the Democrats were getting kind of... Uh... Uh, positive on North Carolina, but here's another factoid, Chip. This uh, he uh, Trump beat Kamala Harris on Latin- on Hispanic men. Yeah, yeah. He, he got more Hispanic voters fr- from the male side than she did. That was significant. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. and and improved from forty three percent to forty six percent from a from a fem- female perspective. Fifty one percent of women in the suburbs. Voted, voted Trump. You know, you know who did well with Harris. It's exactly the stereotype that people have, p- have pinned on the Democrat Party of being elitist. Yeah. It's college-educated, rich, non-religious people. That's who they did well with. Um, other than yeah. that, it's a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And when will the Democrats learn that that Trump say and Lady Gaga doesn't help you? They, they right. thought they would have learned that from Hillary Clinton. They, hey, they don't, Jimmy, they, look at the message that sings. If that sense. Yeah, even Taylor Swift couldn't get her over the top. <laughs> I'm sorry, no. I no. I had to throw that in. B, there has to Chip, there has to be some real soul searching on on oh, that yeah. side of the aisle. And 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 like Jim said, the, here's the shocking part of this: is you look at if you, if you you know I I go across the full political spectrum listening to radio shows and TV, okay? Because I want to hear all sides of it. And it, on more of the left leaning news shows, the reaction. They, there's still not a fundamental firm understanding of what exactly happened here. We're still talking Trump is bad and bewilderment on how they, they lost here, saying that Kamala did nothing wrong in the campaign. It's it it's it's a boy, slow learners. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah but here, uh, here's uh, some policy, potential policy implications, Chip. Bottom line, if the Democrats in Congress really want to come back, they will not be as vociferously against, at least orally, uh, Trump's and the Republican positions. They can fight them, but they can't do it in such an aggressive way as they've had before. Otherwise, they're, they're not you know, getting the signal that they got in this election. Right, right. Brian Grady, uh, here in the state of Iowa, there was some late dust that kind of got blown up in front of the elections when that poll came out that showed that Harris was ahead. And Trump ended up winning the state by like, what was it, 12 or 14 points, something like that? Yeah, and the, that that poll uh, that you're referencing uh, had had been pretty accurate uh, for quite oh, quite yeah. a few elections. So, um, and that that was kind of a surprise. I, I think that was a, a you know that the weekend when it came out the uh, last weekend uh, that that caught a lot of people by surprise. And, and I think you know then you started to hear some of the oh maybe Harris is going to win type of stuff yeah. and and. and that and boy de- just definitely wasn't the case on on election night okay well, this so is a, such a, the, a iowa, the iowa people at usmef told me that it was the makeup of that survey they didn't have as many men as normally in that survey so the the women uh signatures skewed the analysis yeah well why would well, you even that use be it analysis then? i mean isn't that how you do analysis if you know that you're uh you would think you would I mean, think. that's how I do it. I don't I don't know how everybody else does it. But well, they, they were expecting a higher female turnout for the vote that that was that was what it was based on, is that they, they were expecting women were really going to turn out. And th- that's not, you know, not to the extent that they thought. Huh. That's strange. I mean, that's like that's like USDA missing a grain stocks report. Is much yeah. as this. You know, that yeah, was embarrassing. It was just exactly. Embarrassing. Exactly. Exactly. So, Brian, when when the results come in and you start thinking, what does your editorial calendar look like for Pro Farmer as you know, over the next several years, what uh, what thoughts were going through your head as as far as the issues that you're going to have to be covering? Well, obviously, trade, which is a huge one for agriculture. And and you go back to the first Trump presidency and and boy, did we have a lot of trade headlines. I mean, uh, just you know, four years packed full of trade and, and yep. specifically with China. And so that is the number one thing I think that, that everybody, you know, obviously will gravitate toward. But, you know, I I like to question stuff. And, and what if Trump moderates this time around? Because Trump's a, a smart guy. He He's a wild card and he's kind of a smoking gun, but uh, he he's smart. And he learns from mistakes. And he did that uh, through this election process. Right, Jim? Um, but, yeah, uh, he did. Yeah. You, you know, so what if, what if he moderates and isn't as as you know, he's come out a very tough stance against China. And I, I think that some of that will will carry through. Uh, but the flip side of it is, too, is that China's way more prepared this time around. The last time they didn't know. Uh, and and so they're they're better prepared and, and so yeah. we'll see but uh, trade obviously is, is the number one thing and and I think that uh, you know Trump's putting together his uh, team especially his yep. cabinet uh, much faster this time that's something that he learned the last time took him forever uh, and then there were some delays because of confirmations and, and lack thereof and, and those types of things so I I think that uh, we are seeing a, a process here where he learned from the first round and. How much yeah. of a change is there as we go through the second presidency with him? Okay. One thing that we learned from President Trump in in his first term was, you know, we got into it and he started to do some things and people were surprised. And our reaction here was, why are you surprised? This is, is exactly what he said he was going to do. Um, he telegrammed it long ahead of it. So I... I know what you're saying, Beach, but if he does come out and go after and goes after China aggressively with with his tariff plan, uh, I think we need to be ready for that. I think we need to be prepared for that. Okay, like Brian just said, he's putting together his team very very quickly. Chief of staff has already been selected. We'll talk to Jim and get to know Susie Wiles a little bit more. 
right here on AgriTalk. Time for Markets Now with the experts from Pro Farmer. Joining us now, <laughs> Pro Farmer editor Brian Grady. Beach, uh, what's going on in this grain market? Not much happening in the in the wheat, uh, very little movement in, in corn or soybeans when you get right down to it. Got a big report coming. Yeah, absolutely. So I think just kind of biding time here uh, ahead of the reports in a half an hour. But, uh, uh, you know, the the corn market favoring the upside again. And and so we've seen strength uh, repeated. That's that's kind of a repeated pattern that we've seen through the week here. And we had another daily corn sale this morning, known destinations this time. And and so uh, the export demand has just been phenomenal. Now, we had two soybean sales, one to China and one to unknown this morning. But uh, the bean market's pulling back from its recent strength. Uh, of note, the, the soil oil market's just been on fire this week. Uh, it's much calmer today and, and just modestly firmer in the back end of the market. And December contract is mildly weaker at the moment. Yeah, when you take a look at the outside markets, we've got the Dow more than 300 points higher. But crude oil is under some pressure today. And, and then go over to the livestock trade and heavy selling in that cattle complex. What's going on? Yeah, definitely not quiet there. So we gapped lower uh, on the open this morning in, in live cattle futures. And uh, while the cash market seems to be holding up relatively well, wholesale beef prices are, are just plunging and, and heavy pressure on those uh, yesterday afternoon. And, and so uh, that's definitely having an impact, I think, on the uh, the cattle trade here at mid-morning. Okay. On the hog side of things, uh, the cash market continues to rally, but we did see heavy pressure in wholesale pork prices as well, and that's a component of the cash index. And, and so uh, that's putting pressure on the front end of the uh, hog market this morning. All right, good stuff. Thank you, Brian. Brian, stick with us for the next segment here on the Free For All. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. If the world is your oyster, we've got pearls of wisdom on AgriTalk. Welcome back to the Free for All here on AgriTalk. We've got Pro Farmer Editor Brian Grady, Pro Farmer Policy Analyst Jim Wiesmeyer, Sean Ainey, Davis Michelson, and me, your host, Chip Flory. Okay. Um, as Brian mentioned, the staff is coming together pretty quickly. The chief of staff is Susan Summerall Wiles. Susie Wiles, Jim, what do we need to know? First female ever White House Chief of Staff. She's 67 years old, steeped in Florida politics. She's worked on previous Trump uh, campaigns, but she also led the campaign for Ron DeSantis when he went for governor in 2018. She's brought whatever professionalism there is in the Trump campaign is largely as a result of her, Chip. Oh, you, that's would you t- saying a lot right there. Go ahead, Haney. That well, is. Just gonna, in the first, you know, one of the differences maybe that I think we see in this, you know, Trump 2.0 is maybe the chief of staff is able to stick around a little bit longer. There was a pretty rotating door there. <laughs> um, they yeah. could use a little bit more stability on that front. Uh, that, I, I think that's one thing I would confidently say I think it's going to be different this time. Yeah, and maybe maybe he'll have a loyalty sheet by saying to his cabinet people, you won't, you won't write negative books about me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they've those uh, those were on the bestseller list on a lot of you know for a lot of weeks. Those negative books. And, and don't well, let and Michael Jim, Wolf in the building, maybe. Yeah, and and Jim, don't you think that this cabinet people are going to have to uh, probably spend a little time getting to know who the cabinet is because he's going to go outside of Washington this time, isn't he? Yeah, I think so. But uh, they'll be very loyal to him, Chip, and they're going to have to to know uh, his uh, his agenda and and follow it and follow it succinctly. Uh, to just real brief, Chip, on our last conversation before the break, uh, Trump has two years to be very aggressive because the third and fourth year of any president's second term, remember they're a lame duck. And the Republicans will already be positioning for the 2028 election. Yeah. He has two years. And so you watch, even wow. to say something's going to be whirlwind by Trump is something else. It'll be Trump on extra steroids for the next two years. 
Yeah, and right. I think he follows through with what he said. So if, if he says that he's potentially going to put a hundred percent tariff on goods coming into the U.S. from Mexico, if you know the border issue is not sorted from however he defines that, I think they're that yeah. he's going to try to do it. Like I, I don't, I don't know why we would bet against him in that regard because that's well, exactly the first presidency. You guys, and if he has the Senate and the House. Even if it's a slim majority, well, not if, it's going to be a very, very slim majority in the House, whether it's a, a GOP or a uh, Democrat uh, majority there in, in the House. But if he's got all three, Jim, there are going to be huge expectations for these first two years, right? Yes. More than even, remember, he had both chambers when, he first, when his first term. Yep. But he was new. He was new to the presidency. He's learned a lot, and he's got more Trump followers in this new Congress coming in in 2025 than he did in his first two years when he initially right. won the presidency. On the trade angle, I want to bring up: watch where Robert Lighthizer comes in. He'll come back in under what capacity? Because he's even more aggressive, if you can believe this, than Trump is on trade policy. Oh yeah, yeah. No, he he very much is very much. Do you? Th I mean, there are others that are going to be considered for U.S. trade rep, but you talk about loyalty. Brian Lighthizer has shown great loyalty to uh, President-elect Trump. It wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if he's the next U.S. trade rep. Yeah, and you know he he did control a lot of uh, Trump's trade stuff. Uh, while yeah. Trump was the the voice of it, uh, uh, it was Lighthizer that that was behind it uh, largely. Like Jim said, uh, very aggressive yeah. on that front. Yeah, I'm yep. interested in what farm groups that are pro trade in the U.S. do in relation to the phrase integrated supply chain. If you think back to 2016 and the renegotiation renegotiation of NAFTA, farm groups like NCBA, uh, Port Council, they, they focused on, hey, we have an integrated value chain in North America. Integrated value chain. We trade's important. Trade's important. Well, I've heard a lot from you know specifically VP elect JD Vance talking about you know he he doesn't like integrated value chain or supply chains. They like he wants domestic supply chains. And you look at how John Deere. It was singled out in terms of their integrated supply chain. Think about that from a like a cattle perspective. If we apply that same sort of mantra, I think that's going to be very interesting. If we start not if if the phrasing is changed, no longer integrated supply chains, but we change that to change the narrative a little bit. Interesting, interesting. But that takes time. Jim, which, that takes time for, to get for, America first. Right, right. So for agriculture, Jim, which do you think is more important, the Secretary of Ag or the uh, USTR chief? USTR chief. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I, yeah. um, it, it's, it's really going to set the tone for how agriculture is going to proceed going forward is it going to be active in global trade in and i think it'll it, the 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 activity is going to remain in north america in the western hemisphere um i i think the trade but well no i'll just say north america and central america let's throw central america in too but i'm i'm telling you um whether or not it's going to go protectionist or uh, or global is going to be determined here in the next couple of years, and the trade rep is going to have a lot to say about it. Jim, I the other area a lot on the is line. domestic util yeah, the other area is domestic utilization of energy yeah. products. So right. you got to watch not just the energy department. When Republican administrations come in. The National Economic Council frequently has a lot more clout than under a Democrat administration. So watch NEC and the other Council of Economic Advisors. Watch those and how they determine some of these biofuel programs. Will Trump change the 45Z program from a regulatory perspective? 
he, he can't do away with it because that takes right. Congress. And I think Congress right. likes the 45 Z program. Right. I see that continuing, but Trump can change it from a regulatory perspective. Yes. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And we, I, I feel like we had some awesome analysis on the show about the biofuels program going forward uh, from Jordan Fife at BioUrge. We had he was on the show yesterday morning, and basically, it, listen to this, guys. Under the Obama administration, the average margin, the average margin, and this is at two point eight gallons per bushel of corn. But the average margin per gallon under Obama was 48 cents. Under Trump was negative two. Negative two. Under Hmm. Biden was 42 cents. Now, so what has changed? What has changed is those that were pursuing uh, small refinery exemptions under the Trump administration have now made major investments into renewable fuels. They're not going to turn their backs on these investments that they've made. So the message that they're sending to Trump now is let's get 45Z done so that we know exactly how this thing is going to be going forward. It, it's a different environment because of Trump's backers uh, and where they put their investments uh, for, for biofuels going forward. Brian, this biofuel question is going to be a major, major driver of how the markets are going to perform over the next couple of years, right? Absolutely. And, and you know, soy oil, obviously, it's it's had some yeah. major volatility over the past year. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the market that, that you have to watch most closely. Uh, you know, Trump is, is going to be pretty hard on uh, used cooking oil imports, I think, from China, and, which yeah. drives up uh, or in theory drives up domestic uh, soy oil demand. And, and so uh, but the biofuels policy is going, you know, you go back to Trump's first presidency and it was kind of all over the place with with uh, moves and, and inaction and then action and then try this and and don't try this and and back and forth and he tried to appease big oil and tried to appease ethanol and and just didn't work uh and we got a lot of inaction because of that right right okay brian's gonna have to split uh for the usd to get ready for the usda reports uh after this segment tell me beach what are your thoughts going into the crop production supply and demand reports uh, it should be a relatively minor uh, changes, to be honest with you. Uh, okay. Markets expecting slightly lower corn estimate, slightly lower soybean estimate, uh, ending stocks coming down. And, and so uh, I, I think that that's probably, you know, going in, if that's what most are expecting, uh, the flip would be as if we get a, a bigger uh, production and ending stocks estimate for either corn or soybeans, that would that would create a, a negative reaction, obviously, in the markets. But overall, uh, this should be a, a relatively yawner of a report. Okay. All right. Good stuff, Beach. Thanks for jumping in here this morning. Really appreciate you, man. Uh, when we come back with Jim Wiesmeyer, Pro Farmer Policy Analyst, and Sean Haney, Real Agriculture, Real Ag Radio. We've got to tackle a couple of other things here, but included in that is what's the status of the Farm Act? Bankers, bankers are banking on the Farm Act getting done. What are the odds of that happening? Uh, we, We need to do a little bit more on sustainable aviation fuel. And then, Jim, get your list ready. Secretary of Agriculture, if you if you had to narrow it down already, what who's on that list for Secretary of Ag? AgriTalk is brought to you by NeoGen. Prioritizing herd health and embracing genomic testing are key steps toward maximizing your operation's success. Stay ahead of the curve, invest in your herd's health, and uncover their full potential. Learn more at Neogen.com. And welcome back to the Free For All. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday morning. A big thank you to Brian Grady again for jumping in and and, uh, giving us some thoughts on what to look for in the next uh, couple of years. Jim Wiesmeyer, pro former policy analyst, is still with us. Davis Michelson is still with us. Sean Haney, Real Agriculture, Real Ag Radio, 
still with us. Okay. Um, Jim, you've got a list out there already of potential (laughs) USDA secretaries. I mean, this is moving very, very quickly. Uh, Who's on it? Well, uh, Abel Maldonado, he used to be a a California government official. Now, he was passed over... The first in the first Trump administration, but he he tends to be high up on people's list. Kip Tom, okay. uh, Indiana farmer, a uh, former FAO official, and by the way, the election night I saw him at the Mar-a-Lago party, so he was with Trump on yep. election night. Whether that means anything, I'm not quite sure. Zippy Duvall, president of the American Farm Bureau Federation. If Trump calls former USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue and asks him who he wants, I can guarantee you that that uh, Sonny will say Zippy, because Zippy. they're very, yep. very good friends. But there's a whole list of, uh, of others. The one I really like, uh, Chip, is uh, Mike Conaway, former House Ag Committee chairman. If you want experience, he worked closely with uh, Trump on Russia, uh, on a Russia, uh, a sensitive Russia item when he was in Congress. He worked with uh, the Trump administration on food stamp reform. Uh, so watch him. He could be a dark horse. Uh, well, and he's a the, he's the a guy that gets ones stuff are, done. Uh, Texas Ag Commissioner uh, Thomas Mann, representative from Kentucky. I just don't see him in there. He's too arch conservative. But if Trump wants him out of Congress, <laughs> put him in USDA. That would be the only reason I think he picks Thomas Massey if he does. But but their uh, host their their host I'd majority may be through. very oh, Ray slight. Star- Ray Starling, yeah, Ray Starling. He's from North Carolina. He's almost too good to be true if he would be selected. <laughs> he knows the hog industry. He knows the feed grains industry. He's a lawyer by training. He's had several uh, administration positions in the Trump administration before. And that's just a little list, Chip. Uh, frequently, yeah. it might be somebody that's not even on the short list. So okay. doesn't the Haney, same majority they would have in the House kind of caution them on pulling somebody out of the house for for to put into cabinet and and one of the names i wanted your guys reaction what about north dakota governor doug burgum right is is he potentially yeah, doug burgum he's he's on the list but he's more in the energy and i think he would want an energy environment he could do agriculture because he you know anybody from north dakota knows agriculture yeah. So, but he is yeah. on the list for USDA as well. I know I put him on my list. Yeah, yeah. I think Burgum is definitely going to be in the administration. I just don't know if it is going to be agriculture, energy, or even commerce. Right, Jim? It could be because Trump, uh, uh, their families uh, really got along. So I agree with yep. you, Chip. He's coming in under what capacity? Not quite sure because he's an entrepreneur just like Trump was and he know, he knows he knows he knows business 101 yep jim i know what you said on uh representative massey and and sean i hear you there you know do you if you've got a slim majority do you mess with it but jim i'm telling you there's a groundswell out there on social media that wants massey hmm well it, it would get a thorn in the house leadership out of the way i'll tell you that and I guess his district in Kentucky would be a safe Republican district. Now, if they're at only 218 in the House, I don't think you do it, Chip. But if it's uh, up to 220, 221 in the House for the Republicans, then then I think he could do it if, if that's the case. I, I'm just not quite yeah. sure, thank you, what he yeah. brings to it myself. But that's well, me. Well, I... I, you know, I think what the what the thoughts are is that uh, he would push to eliminate a lot of the farm supports that are out there. And that's where the groundswell yeah. is coming from. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, if you want an initial battle, that that would be it. Uh, real briefly, Chip, give me about 30 seconds. I think if there's going to be a fly in the ointment for Trump, it's going to be the financial markets relative to the bond market. If, if inflationary expectations rise as a result of these trade tariffs and, and tax cuts later on, uh, that could return the focus to the economy. 
yep. where it would delay Trump's interest in a lot of other areas. So yep. watch that bond market in the year ahead. Well, it's Absolutely. interesting. All of those names you went through, Jim, the, the phil- philosophical differences of all those people uh, and, and the direction potentially that USDA goes oh. going forward. It, <laughs> oh, that's fascinating huge. to me. Those, like it's those aren't, you just didn't give us like, yeah, like four, six names where it's like, yeah, you know what? They're all pretty good and can kind of see the direction. We, we, we're we looking at a wide swath of philosophies here on where to go with USDA. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Um, if, if, if I'm going to put together uh, three people that I think it might be, like you said, Jim, on Ray Starling, that would just kind of be... Holy smokes! Uh, how how did that happen? Because he is so knowledgeable and and has such a wide range of experience. I'm gonna put Kip Tom probably at the top of the list. Uh, and the reason that I'm doing it doing that is because Kip has been there for President Trump the whole way, the whole way. He has. And he comes and he's off market, of that. He's market oriented. And he's market, market oriented. oriented. Yep. Uh, Zippy is is on the list for sure. Maldonado is kind of a dark horse, I think. But as you said, he has been so loyal to Trump the whole time um, that you can't rule that out as well. Fantastic job today, you guys. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for making time, buddy. Be safe on your travels. Haney, thank you. We'll talk to you again real soon, okay, man? Yeah, absolutely. Cheers, everybody. Have a great weekend. All right, uh, man, oh, man. Come back this afternoon. Davis and I will have the details of USDA reports for you right here on Agritalk.